Welcome to the fourth and final video from chapter six, section one, subsection two. This one focusing on shaping the beam for cantilevers and for continuity over interior supports. So far we've talked about beams being subjected to internal moments. In the case of the beam on the top here, we have simple supports at each end. The beam is deflecting downward and there's a curvature induced in it. And that curvature is being induced by the moment stresses, which are compressing the material in the top of the beam and stretching the material in the bottom of the beam. The moment is zero at the ends in this case and a maximum in the middle. And if we went and actually studied the curvature of the neutral axis of this beam, we would discover that the amount of curvature at any point, point along the beam is in direct proportion to the amount of moment. So for example, we have no curvature right at the ends because the moment is zero, and we have a maximum curvature in the middle and the amount of curvature varies uh, according to the parabolic variation in the internal moment. If we put the beam on top of a single central support, we induce a curvature in the exact opposite direction. The maximum of curvature, a curvature occurs at the center um, with zero curvature at each end. In this case, this cantilever here is half of the length of that simple span, and likewise this cantilever is half of the length of that simple span. And by uh, arguments that we have developed previously, we say that the burden in terms of internal moment on a cantilever that is half the length of a simple span is the same as the burden of the moment at the center here. In other words, the, the worst moment for this situation is the same as the worst moment for that situation. We can have combinations of the, these two types of spanning action. So, for example, if I were to draw the moment, moment diagram for a simple span, it would occur here. It would start at zero, it would rise to a maximum, and come back to zero. When I pull the supports in from the end, I now have a cantilever on this end, a cantilever on that end, and something more complex than a simple span occurring in between. And the reason it's more complex is that we have all the tendencies to deflect downward under this load between the supports. But these cantilevers are inducing a moment on the portion of the beam between the supports, which is tending to lift it up. So that moment is actually pretty drastically diminished in the mid-span by the effect of the cantilevers which are dragging the moment down uh, to negative values before it's allowed to start up again. So if I looked at this parabola right here, that would be the moment diagram for a simple span spanning from there to there but the effect of this negative moment that's being uh, imposed upon it by the cantilevers is to pull the curve down. So in other words, instead of the curve sitting up here, it's been pulled down by that amount and that becomes the, the moment diagram between the supports. So here we have a negative curvature with tension on the top, compression on the bottom. Here we have a positive moment or a positive curvature with uh, compression on the top of the beam and tension on the bottom. And then it goes through zero and then it goes to a maximum negative moment where we have tension on the top of the beam and compression on the bottom. And you'll notice the shear becomes negative uh, for this particular cantilever. Then it shoots up and shows us the usual shear curve uh, between the two supports and then we end up with a positive shear associated with that cantilever. Now, this is one particular location for the supports which was rather arbitrarily drawn and at this point you'll notice the positive moment is still larger in magnitude than the negative moment, but we can move the support in and out and explore uh, 
uh, what the implications of that are. So here we have a series of beams. They all have the same length. They all have the same uniform load along the entire length of the beam. In this case, we have simply supported at the ends with a substantial positive moment at the side. This curve, of course, is parabolic. Uh, that parabola changes when we begin to slide the supports in. So here we have fairly modest overhangs and we're beginning to see slight negative moments, but they're relatively minor and the positive moment between the supports is still the dominant one. But this has been pulled down fairly substantially compared to this for two reasons. One is the span here is much shorter than the span there, but also the curve has been pulled down by this initial negative moment before we even start on the portion between the supports. If we move the supports in further, we see that the negative moment associated with this longer cantilever has increased, and this positive moment has decreased quite dramatically. When we move these supports in to the perfect point, we will have a situation where the magnitude of this negative moment is exactly equal to the magnitude of this positive moment. That is the support configuration that produces, under uniform load, the minimal moment. You can't do any better than that. We've been making the positive moment at the center smaller and smaller, but now we've reached the point where it is rivaled by the negative moment over the supports. And if we pull the supports in any further, the negative moment will become dominant. And in fact, the positive moment will disappear. So this would be called the optimal. It turns out that this cantilever is 20.7% of the overall length of the beam from there to there. 20.7% and you can work that out mathematically to get it to however many degrees of accuracy you want. Um, that's for a uniform load that's everywhere. If you have a shifting load, such as a live load, that alters the mathematics of the optimal cantilever. So this would be the optimal cantilever under dead load or some uniform load such as snow. If we continue to move the supports inward and take them to the quarter points, then it turns out this half of the beam is balanced over that support, this half of the beam is balanced over that support, and there's no longer any need for there to be a moment at the center of this overall beam to keep everything balanced and it's as if this whole system is in equilibrium and that system is equal in equilibrium and they're just barely connected here for stability purposes so um, there would need to be some balance here otherwise uh, this load which is never perfectly balanced could cause the two halves to flop but at this point the structural significance of this portion of the beam is much less than the structural significance of that. If we, supply, if we slide the forces in either even further, the negative moments associated with the cantilevers increase. And by the way, this is a little more detail than we need to get into at this point, but it turns out that this parabola, which is representing that cantilever, is exactly the same as the parabola for that, is exactly the same as that, which is the same as that, and all the way down, it ends up being this portion of a parabola. The only difference is that that negative moment can only build up to whatever point we have the support at, and beyond that, then it begins to go back up associated with the influence of the loads between the supports. So how bad this negative moment becomes depends upon how far back in we want to pull these supports. When you think about cantilevers, think about that in that when you cantilever further, you're adding more of this burden as opposed to, you may think of yourself as adding more on the end,
but in fact you're simply determining how much further along this parabola you're actually going to go. If we pull the supports all the way to the center where they're both coincident with each other, then we have no space between the supports. It's pure cantilever on this side, pure cantilever on that side. There is no space between the supports. We have a very severe negative moment. It turns out that the magnitude of this negative moment is just equal to the magnitude of that positive moment. And that is consistent with our statement that the burden on a cantilever of a given length is the same as the moment burden on a simple span of twice the length. Or in other words, with a given beam cross-section under a given loading of W per in pounds per linear foot, you can span twice as far with that beam in simple span mode as you can in cantilever mode. Also, of course, there are other practical considerations like the columns that occur at the end of this beam restrain movement so that you can have glass there safely. There's no such restraint at the end of this beam, so if you put glass out here, you have to worry about how it gets uh, affected by the movement of the end of this cantilever. That explains, by the way, why we rarely use significant cantilevers uh, unless we're in a situation where we don't have glass at the end. For example, in a sports arena where you don't want a column out there and you don't want any glass and you want an unobstructed view, you will cantilever because you can tolerate the cantilever movement. That, of course, doesn't show up in any of these diagrams. That's a deflection issue and not a moment issue or a failure of the beam issue. Now we can do a, a similar kind of thing where instead of moving both ends in we keep this end fixed and we move this end inward and when we do that we create a cantilever on one end and when we draw the moment diagrams they look like this. So here we've moved the support in and induced this negative moment and then some more and then some more and then finally we reach the optimum here. This optimum occurs when this length is 29% of the overall length. When the cantilever length is 29% of the overall length of the beam, the magnitude of the negative moment is just equal to the magnitude of the positive moment. From that moment on, as you continue to move the support in, the positive moment diminishes, the negative moment increases, and eventually you reach this situation again where for all intents and purposes all the supports at the center. We may still have a support here, but it's not doing anything because the load is balanced over this interior support. Okay, so we'd like to explore some ways in which this uh, entire um, technique of using cantilevers can be utilized. So. Let's look at a double cantilever situation and again we're sort of looking for something in the optimal zone but we're also asking ourselves what should the shape be and we know the shape ought to be tapered downward uh, when we're on the cantilever end but a different shape between the supports. So here we see a structure where we have over the tops of these girders, and it's hard to see here, but we have a double girder and then we have a roof element or beam going over the top of that. And by the way, this is wood construction. We have a hard time generating moments in wood, so we tend to use this kind of bypass structure where these wooden elements that are spanning in this direction are sitting on top of these girders. And you'll notice they've been tapered on the cantilever end but nothing has been done in the middle and the reason is that that would take work and wouldn't enhance the structure in any way so we just left it uniform the way the beam was originally made between the supports and tapered it only on the ends. This is another view where this girder you'll notice has been tapered at the end to express the nature of what's going on in that cantilever and by the way they could have tapered it with a curvature that represented the moment, but visually it's just as good to keep it as a straight line, and that's easier to make that cut 
And also there's a load out on the end here which means that you never want the thing to go to zero because you still have to have some shear capacity out there. So this is just showing you some simple things that you can do to begin to express this cantilever function. And this is one more example of that kind of theme where we have a glue lamb beam which has been tapered at the ends. You'll notice this beam, ha for expression reasons, has been carried beyond the edge of the roof, which is fine. You'll notice that it's been treated with a kind of a metal covering that keeps the end grain of this wood from wicking inward and generally reduces the amount of moisture damage that's likely to occur. All right, so we can go to a variety of uh, situations. We might want to think about where something like this might get used. And this may seem extreme, but it may turn out that we have an architectural situation where what's going on between is not all that interesting or not architecturally that important, but the cantilever is tremendously important and that would uh, there are a variety of situations we might think of we talked about sports arenas where we want it really open out at the end of the cantilever but it may turn out that for whatever reason access at the end here is the most crucial issue so uh, as an example of that we'll take this hangar at the san francisco airport um, this shows it during construction this would normally be a, a triangulated trust roof. There is some triangulation in it that had to do with the original construction, but it turns out that this corrugated steel decking is pretty heavy duty decking and they welded it to the top cord and the bottom cord and in effect created this uh, plate girder, uh, which is a sawtooth in nature or uh, basically is corrugated folded plate structural behavior. In the case of this, there are powerful columns here and there. There are wide grade beams that keep this thing from toppling over under wind load. All of this that you see here, these columns, these truss columns, on this side and that side, those are temporary shoring. So in its final configuration, this is the support and the roof cantilevers out and this is a hanger. It has sliding doors on it. Um, those sliding doors are not primary structure because they have to be able to pull back. And this photograph was taken to illustrate a basic point. This is a 747 which was the biggest plane flying at the time that this hanger was constructed. And you'll notice the sun's shadow pattern here and by the way the sun is 94 million miles away so the shadow that you see on this building due to this plane which is parallel to that face the shadow indicates that that plane fits inside this building if it can put its nose between the column structure in here in the core of the building so this hangar was actually designed so that 747s can be driven inside of it and the thing be shut down to protect the mechanics who are working on the plane against wind and other weather related issues. Now we probably think of this as pretty spectacular that one cantilever covers this entire plane and we think of the cantilevered wings of this plane as pretty significant, but um, before we as architects and engineers of buildings get too puffed up about this um, we should keep in mind that these cantilevers fly close to the speed of sound um, and until we design a building that can do that we need to have respect for the extraordinary uh, engineering and design and technology that goes into a plane like this. But I show this because it's a pretty spectacular example of the kind of overhang that we can achieve at a fairly economical price and this is a great place to do it because we have to have access for the full width of this plane to move into this building. So we can afford, cannot afford to do it in any other way than as an overhang.
Okay, so um, we can uh, imagine these sort of moment diagrams associated with other kinds of situations. For example, we might want to come fairly close to this where we have fairly long overhangs on the exterior. So this would be an example. Here you see an overhang that's almost as long as that portion right there. So in fact, the center part of the structure is very thin because this and that are essentially balanced over that support point. So we're very close to the point where this member is pushing in very close to the quarter point. We can also do this kind of configuration and this shows an example of that. So it's essentially supported along the center line cantilevered off to each side. In this case some of these beams are supported over supports but some of them are supported by a beam that goes across. You'll notice in this case that beam is a round tube and that's that way because that's not only a pretty good beam but it's torsionally very sound and as long as we have members like this out near the middle that could rotate this way and rotate around that way this tubular element has got to resist that but you'll notice here these are deepest at the center and they taper towards the outside um, in this case they were not given curvature because it's easier to take this huge plate and just cut it on a shear which tends to cut it on a straight line Here's another example. This beam has its maximum moment here and this long cantilever. This is a short cantilever, so there's a need for a significant uh, compressive strut there. That compressive strut, by the way, has been rendered as very thin because it's very short and we're not worried about its buckling, but that's probably solid steel in that strut. But nonetheless, this is the same kind of situation where we have symmetric or almost symmetric loads about a key central support. So we're showing this as deep at the center and tapering towards that end. Here's another example of that. Doesn't show up too well in this picture, but we have a central support and tapered beams. We have another point here which is against overturning wind load we would like for this column to be widest at the base but for other aesthetic reasons which might be hard to imagine in this case given the appearance of this thing it was made narrower at the base to look more like a human being uh, standing under this load here we have uh, another example of asymmetric load in this case, one cantilever is longer than the other, and in this case, this tubular element becomes crucial because its torsional action is what keeps this cantilever from drooping down. Okay, so now I want to talk about, instead of overhangs, we want to shift to the issue of continuity over an interior support. So here we're showing the moment diagram for a simple span beam that's supported at this end and that end. If we strung two of these together it would look like this. So they would have a center support but they're not moment connected at the end so the moment diagram for each individual one does not change. If that beam, instead of being one beam going from there to there and another one going from there to there, became a single beam that ran the entire length. We would have continuity over the center. At this interior support, the beam would have tension on the top, compression on the bottom, or in other words, would have a negative moment, and that negative moment would look like this. In terms of deflection, we see the deflection curve for that case the two deflection curves for this case and then in this case you'll notice there's continuity over the supports so the two things come and meet horizontally at that point and you'll notice the deflection here is much lower than the deflection there which is why continuity over an interior support is often considered to be 
extremely important for shallow elements that are governed by deflection such as decking. So now if we look at this moment diagram we might see several things one of which is the worst moment is this negative moment and then there are these locations of zero moment which presumably are less critical parts of the beam. So we can begin to design for that and here is a classic example. Here we have a plate girder of constant depth, but you'll notice that the bottom cord over this zone has been made thicker, and then a thinner bottom cord has been used for the parts, or bottom flange, where for the parts where the moment is not so severe. We also have this uh, bracing element or a stiffener that's been welded to the web here because there's a huge force coming up out of the support and that force will crumple and buckle the web of this beam without that stiffener. So here's a classic example where we've adjusted the web um, to account, or excuse me, the flange, in this case the flange thickness, to account for the increased moment. And you'll notice, by the way, where this weld joint occurs, it's a tapered joint that's filled in with weld to provide that taper um, because otherwise there'll be too much stress concentration at that sharp corner. Uh, another interesting thing to note is the field connections, which are done with bolts, are here and there, and they are essentially at those points of zero moment under uniform load. Now, you'll notice there are a lot of bolts there, and there are even bolted connections between the flanges. And the reason is that under the full range of possible loads, this is not actually a zero moment location. Under asymmetric loading, where say half of the bridge on that side is loaded and the other half isn't, or where half this half is loaded and that half isn't, that load will produce some significant moment here. So even though this is the best place to go to do a field splice, it still takes some serious attention in terms of assuring continuity of both the flanges and of the web. Now, there are other ways to deal with this large negative moment, one of which is to vary the depth. And in the case of this beam, this plate girder, they varied the depth of the beam, making it maximum right there, and they've also varied the thickness. So you'll notice this portion of the bottom flange is thicker than that portion. And again, you see the field splices occurring there. And I can't overemphasize the logic of this. Putting those splices there and there rather than putting two simple spans to the middle uh, has also the advantage that this span plus the other spans on each end are shorter than we would have if we went from this support point to uh, some other support point out at the boundary. So everything tells us this is a really logical place to put that field splice. Now in this case we don't have a very wide median and we might be concerned about uh, vehicles being, to pull, being able to pull off here so we don't come down too far with this. Truck drivers know to avoid this right here You'll also note, though, that the ground has been sculpted, so even if you drive down here, you probably still have pretty good clearance under this bridge. But if we don't have those kinds of restraints, we might even think about doing something like this. So in this case, they, instead of making the beam deeper, they've reached out with their column, and the column has almost become like part of the beam. So instead of the beam coming down to a cusp, it comes down really dramatically and gets much deeper and that deep part of the beam is also part of the column. Now, if we think about that whole idea of continuity, there are some interesting things we can talk about. For example, here we have three simple span beams. One going from there to there, one from there to there, one from there to there. So that's represented by pin joints. So Right here I have that case, here's the moment diagram, 
and this above is the wireframe view of that showing the pin joint there and there. Now the middle case which is right here and which is right there is the case of this beam coming continuously across all three spans and we got a negative moment and that negative moment is the dominant moment it's larger than that positive moment and we might ask ourselves what can we do to design for that well the usual thought process is we come in with three beams of equal length and we span like this we don't want to do this because the beam probably gets to be too long and too hard to manage although you'll notice this beam is now shallower than that one because this negative moment is not as bad as that positive moment so in other words if we could go with a continuous beam all the way across we save a substantial amount of material we just don't know where, how to handle that so what we can do is we can run a continuous beam that goes over that support and cantilevers out and then we have simple span from there to there and then we have continuous beam again over here now we chose these points to make those pin connections to support this simple span based on this diagram when we analyzed the continuous beam it said there's a zero moment point there and a zero moment point there so that's the logical place to make a field connection so now we discover something interesting if we go cut this portion of this continuous beam out and replace it because this moment is so small we can actually replace that with an even smaller beam so instead of three simple spans such as shown along the bottom here if we have a continuous member that cantilevers out to the optimal point another member over here that cantilevers out to the optimal point and then we simple span between there we effectively get a moment diagram that mimics a continuous beam but has the further advantage that this particular section section right in here is actually smaller so this shows conceptually how that works continuous beam out to the support point continuous beam out to that support point and then a simple span beam in between and this is what that would look like in practice in this case there's a continuous beam that comes across to this point uh, the beam has been stiffened at this location above this column because the column is delivering a very large upward force which would tend to buckle the web of this beam but you'll notice there's a very minimal connection right here and unfortunately I don't have a close-up of that uh, and we can sort of see one here but basically in this case there's an angle welded to that beam an angle welded to that and they are bolted together but they can also be done by just scabbing a plate uh, on each side of these beams with a few bolts in it and that plate becomes the means of shear transfer between this beam and that beam. In this case the span that involves this beam is actually quite large and that's uh, evidenced by the fact that this beam is actually deeper than the beam that's supporting it and that's a completely legitimate uh, situation and it's expressed in the following uh, diagram which is right here where we basically are saying if we go with this idea of a continuous beam we can spread the distance between these supports and bring it to the point where this positive moment and that negative moment are essentially equal and when we get there then we'd be using the same depth of section across here but this portion would be continuous out to that point this portion would be continuous over the support to that point and then the simple span part in between would be comparable in depth to what's there because the positive moment it has to deal with between there and there is equal to the negative moment that this section of beam has to deal with here now I don't have any good distance shots of uh, beams like this this is the best image that I've got which unfortunately I did not zoom back far enough to take advantage of 
give you the full image, but I will show you an example of a building that's kind of based on this principle. And again, I apologize because this is not a great shot either, but this is the San Francisco International Airport. It has this lenticular truss here, another lenticular truss, and another one. And unfortunately, there are two columns, one right there and one right there you can't see, but you can see those comparable columns over here. So in this case, they didn't put this column at the end. They pulled it back in because that looks really cool. And it turns out that's also a really excellent configuration in terms of minimizing moments. So there's two supports there. Symmetrically, there are two supports over here. This is a simple span truss in between. So if I go show you the interior of that building, here are two supports under a side lenticular truss. There's another side lenticular truss with two supports. And then this is the lenticular truss that spans the long space on the interior. So this is a, unfortunately this is not beams, but it illustrates the, the basic point that with clever supports and proper design of your spanning members, uh, you can span very long distances while only having to pay for a structure that seemingly spans much less. So this simple span structure in, this in the middle here is not nearly as long as the distance between that column and that column. So we've gotten a really long column spacing at the cost of a fairly modest uh, simple span. That ends our video on shaping the beam for cantilevers and continuity over interior supports.